Have you ever considered the amount of data an audio recording takes up on a storage device like a CD? I mean, who hasn't? Audio on CDs are encoded with two channels sampled at 44.1 kHz with a 16-bit word. What this means is that to play a song off of a CD, data has to be read at a rate of 2 times 44,100 words per second times 16 bits per word for a data rate of 1,411 kilobits per second. 1,411 kilobits per second is rather fast, and this just includes the pure data. In reality, to send 16 information bits over any network, more bits are needed for things like error correcting and framing. The CD protocol in particular requires 49 total bits per word to account for its error correcting codes and digital modulation. This brings the data rate up to 4,322 kilobits per second, which would be enough to swamp a slow internet connection if you are watching a YouTube video with just the audio alone. But you are clearly able to watch fantastic videos like this one all over the internet, so how is that possible? The answer is through audio and video compression. This video will solely focus on audio compression, and specifically the psychoacoustic model in the MP3 encoder, which makes transmitting sounds over wireless networks possible. Audio compression has existed for a long time, particularly for speech. My voice right now is being compressed by an older, simpler encoding method called linear predictive coding. The level of audio distortion of linear predictive encoding makes speech understandable, but would be undesirable when listening to music. Compressing music is much more difficult, yet the MP3 encoder can bring the average data rate down to a much more manageable 128 kilobits per second, and it does this through a deep understanding of human hearing and auditory perception. This makes it a fascinating intersection between human physiology, math, and engineering. To understand how the MP3 encoder can remove so much data and still have songs and other audio recordings sound the same, we first need to understand how the human ear works. This is the absolute threshold of human hearing. At the bottom, along the horizontal axis, is the range of frequencies that humans can hear on a logarithmic scale. For those not familiar with how a logarithmic axis works, the divisions do not represent a linear additive increase, but rather a multiplicative one. In this case, each tick represents a multiplication by 10, so the range of this region is 180, while the range of this region is 18,000. The vertical axis shows the minimum audible sound pressure level for an ideally healthy young adult. This is also logarithmic, as it is in decibels, so a 20 decibel jump is a 10x increase in air pressure. What this means is that sounds above this line are generally audible to humans, while stuff below this line is not. For scale, a whisper is about 30 decibels, a normal conversation is about 60 decibels, and 120 decibels is where sound begins to hurt. As you can see, humans are most sensitive around 3 kilohertz, and least sensitive out towards 20 and 20 kilohertz. A graph like this offers one natural solution for potential data that can be removed. Basically, just remove any noises in the section under this graph that cannot be heard anyways. This would compress the data slightly, but not enough as it turns out most of the noise in an audio recording is within the audible range which makes sense since we tend to record stuff that we can actually hear. A solution like this also presents the unavoidable problem of how exactly would you go about removing these noises in a way that decreases the stored data and does not disturb other audible noises. The solution to the first problem is to continue to develop our understanding of human hearing. Through experiments of the cochlea, neurophysiologists and psychophysicists have determined that human hearing can be split up into roughly 25 critical bands across the entire audible frequency range. One typical way to show this is through the bark scale, where the bands are laid out like this, and where each band corresponds to a section of the cochlea itself. Notice the frequency range of each band increases as the frequencies get higher. These sections of the cochlea each act as noise filters which remove high and low frequencies outside of their corresponding range. For example, a frequency of 600 Hz, shown by this black dot, will not activate the sections of the cochlea far from this band, will slightly activate the sections near or adjacent to the 600 Hz band, and will activate the corresponding 600 Hz band the most. This type of filter is referred to as a band pass filter because it ideally passes one band of frequencies and stops all others. What this means physically is that we have more trouble distinguishing multiple nearby frequencies when played simultaneously, as opposed to far apart frequencies, because the same section of the cochlea is responsible for the detection of those nearby frequencies. This leads to an effect known as auditory masking, where a louder sound can completely cover up a quieter one. Masking sounds, or maskers, can be categorized into two groups, tonal and noise. Tonal maskers are where one loud frequency does the masking, and noise maskers are where a small band of continuous frequencies does the masking. 
Tonal and noise maskers generally work in the same way, but noise maskers mask sounds much better than tonal maskers, so the distinction is important. Now let's go back to the absolute threshold of human hearing and see a graphical depiction of a tonal masker. Remember, everything above the line is audible. Imagine playing a tone at 1000 Hz and 60 decibels, which would be represented by this X on the graph. It has been experimentally determined that a tone such as this one would completely mask all frequencies within this red cone. Notice that this tone can block frequencies that are rather far away, so long as they are quiet enough. This red cone is the local threshold of this particular tone masker. It can then be overlaid on the original threshold graph to create a new global graph of human audible frequencies when a thousand hertz tone is being played at 60 decibels. Of course, songs and other audio recordings usually have more than one tone, so this needs to be done for all the tone and noise maskers within a recording. To do this, the full frequency content of the intended recording must be extracted. Now, for those that have experienced the joys of signal processing and this type of work, we'll know the natural next step. But for the few that don't know what's coming, to get the frequency content of a sampled recording, we can use something known as the discrete Fourier transform, or DFT. For the purposes of this video, a DFT takes in a sampled input and outputs all of the frequencies that make up that input. The way computers do this computation, and the way the MP3 encoder does it, is through an algorithm known as the fast Fourier transform, or FFT. This is all the information that is needed for this video, but the DFT and FFT are important and nuanced topics that cannot be completely covered in this video. There are, however, plenty of resources on the internet that cover this topic much better than I ever could. Back to our maskers. Let's do an example with our threshold of hearing. Imagine placing three tone maskers at these locations, marked by X's, and two noise maskers, marked here, by O's. From here we can place the experimentally determined local thresholds of all of these maskers and then add them up. This can then be overlaid on the original threshold, which gives us a new global threshold for hearing over these sounds. And as it turns out, destroying data that results in noise under this graph saves a lot more data than our original threshold of hearing. But we still need to answer our other question of how this data can be easily removed. The answer to this question is quantization. Imagine you have a sine wave that represents an audible tone like this. For a sound to be recorded digitally, it must be discretized or quantized along both the x and y axis. Along the x axis, or in time, this is done through sampling, where a sampling rate is set so that evenly spaced values of the sound are captured. We sample sound data and plenty of other information like this for two reasons. The first is that it does not require our devices to store data about the time positions of any of these points. The second reason might seem a little unintuitive. But sampling like this does not lose any information about the original signal. This is an incredibly powerful fact. What it means is that even though we are representing an uncountably infinite number of points with a small finite set of points, we can always perfectly reconstruct our original wave from the samples, regardless of what the original wave looked like. Now there is a caveat to this, that the sampling rate must be at least two times the highest frequency the signal contains, but fortunately for us, humans can only hear up to 20 kilohertz, so we just need to sample at at least 40 kilohertz. This is why you see a 44.1 kilohertz sampling rate all over the place. Now that we have our sampled values, we still need to quantize the values themselves. This can be done by determining the number of bits we want to store in each sampled value, and then forcing our samples to a nearby predefined level where the number of levels is based on the number of bits we choose. For example, a 3-bit quantization means we can have 2 to the power of 3, which is 8 levels. We can then divide up our original output range into 8 levels, and then force every point to the level that's closest to. Doing so would look like this. Of course, the more bits we use, the better this quantization approximation gets. But it also means the recording will take up more storage space. Now the final question presents itself. How can we use our previous psychoacoustic model to mathematically determine what is the lowest level of quantization we can use to record and play a sound without degrading the sound in an audible way? Well, to start, let's imagine our quantized recording as the sum of two functions, the first being our original non-quantized wave, and the second being a function representing the quantization error that gets us to the quantized version. Of course, if we treat these things as functions, we can play around with them like this all we want. But by doing this in the context of a sound recording, we are representing a physical and mathematical property of waves known as superposition. Superposition basically just means you can add two waves together. 
and in the context of a sound wave, it means two sounds played together will create a wave that's the sum of the two individual waves. We can interpret this to mean that the quantization error function itself can be thought of as a sound that is being played along with the sound of the non-quantized recording. If we want to make this quantization error be inaudible, we have to make sure that the original sound masks it, which is where what we did before comes back in. Using the model we developed, we can now precisely find the lowest necessary quantization for our sound clip. Let's do a full example. Take this recording. The D of T of the recording looks like this. Now we have to determine the locations of the tone and noise maskers. Now we place our experimentally determined local masking thresholds and mush them together to generate our global threshold. Now let's quantize our clip to 3, 5, and 7 bits and plot the D of T of the quantization error over our masking threshold. As you can see, the 3-bit clip is clearly above the threshold at some points. The 5-bit clip is close and barely above at some points, and the 7-bit clip is above everywhere. Take a listen to the three clips. I cannot hear the distortion in the 5-bit clip when I play the raw audio from my computer, but this distortion might be audible if it was played very loud. Now, maybe not surprisingly, the full MP3 encoder does a lot more than just this, as it has to determine over what ranges to do this quantization, and has to deal with temporal masking effects among many other things. But with this method, I was able to reduce each sample from a 32-bit floating point number, which is how my program extracted the raw audio data down to a 7-bit number, which makes the audio data significantly smaller without a noticeable drop in quality.